My goal with this talk is first uh, to give you guys some insight into what really happens when professional projects go badly. Um, to tell you about some of the pitfalls that I have run into uh, in games that, that I've been on. Uh, and also to give you some strategies to avoid the same problems when you are making your own games. <clears throat> this talk will be broadly focused on design, uh, but I will also be addressing some um, production and project management issues uh, because in a lot of cases they are inextricably linked to the design things that you might run into. So, first of all, who am I? Um, my name is George Zeitz. I have been a professional game designer and writer since 2001. Um, for most of my career, I have been working on RPGs and RPG hybrids because those are the genres that I love best. Um, first, I was at uh, in, uh, Obsidian Entertainment and then later at In Exile. Until July of this year, I was lead designer on Wasteland 3 at In Exile, um, but I actually left uh, fairly recently and I started my own studio. Uh, Digimancy Entertainment, uh, which is based right here in Ohio. So you can see a bunch of the games that I've worked on right up here. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about two of the ones that you see there. Uh, I think they will illustrate some common mistakes uh, that I've seen repeated on many projects throughout my career. Um, plus you'll get a little inside dirt as to what really happened on uh, a couple professional games and since there's like very few people here you are probably the only ones who will know this information uh, so don't record me. Um, so before I start uh, a couple caveats that you should be aware of. Uh, first everything I am about to tell you is drawn from my own personal experience. Um, if you talked to someone else who was on these games with me, you'd probably get a different account of what went right and what went wrong. Um, I also do not speak for any of the companies that I was working for at the times when I made these games. Uh, I'm only speaking from my own personal perspective. Second, uh, none of these games should be considered an unmitigated failure. Um, one of them had a Metacritic score uh, that was in the sevens or so. Uh, another had a Metacritic score that was kind of like in the eights, uh, which was not bad. Uh, user scores were not quite so good. Uh, the user score for one was really not so good. The user score for the other was like in the sevens, uh, so not terrible. But um, neither of them was a commercial success, uh, and neither of them uh, would be considered, um, neither of them did as well as the team set out to make them. So in that sense, they were a disappointment. So, without any further, um, game number one is Dungeon Siege 3. Uh, it was a multiplayer action RPG. It was made by Obsidian Entertainment. Uh, it started development in 2001, um, and it shipped in 2011. If you have not heard of Dungeon Siege 3, there are good reasons for that, and we're about to talk about them. Um, one really interesting point about this game is that it began life as another game. Baldur's Gate 3. Um, to explain, in 2008-2009, uh, Obsidian Entertainment was in talks with Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro, uh, who were the, the uh, license holders for the Baldur's Gate series, to make the third installment in the Baldur's Gate series. This was a pretty big deal uh, because the Baldur's Gate series had been well regarded. Baldur's Gate 1 was groundbreaking in its time, uh, came out in the late 90s. Um, Baldur's Gate 2 uh, was considered at the time, and is still considered by some people, the best all-round RPG of all time. Um, fans had been waiting for a sequel to these games for about a decade. Um, and in RPG development circles, a lot of people, including me, really wanted to work on the next installment of these games. Yes, that was our team. Um, so. At Obsidian, uh, talks with the license holders seemed to be going really well. Uh, so they went ahead and hired a team and actually started pre-production on the game. Uh, hired or assembled, because a lot of people were already there at Obsidian. Now, I had actually left Obsidian about a year before this. Uh, I had gone to Bethesda. But when they offered me a chance to come back and be the lead narrative designer on Baldur's Gate 3, I was like, OK. And I left, and I flew back across the country uh, abandoned Bethesda and went back to Obsidian. 
Uh, and I was not the only one who was super excited about working on Baldur's Gate 3. Um, we were all pretty psyched, just like the picture. Um, the only problem was, <laughs> we are not working on Baldur's Gate 3, it turned out. Um, so the talks with the license holders fell apart. Um, and instead of Baldur's Gate 3, we were told, you are working on Dungeon Siege 3. This was perhaps not as exciting as Baldur's Gate 3 had been. As a side note, uh, you may know this already, but Baldur's Gate 3 is actually in production now, uh, many years later. It's being made at Larian Entertainment. Um, it took another eight years or so for that deal to get made, even for a series that is as well regarded as Baldur's Gate and seems like a no-brainer. Um, it can take a... Hello. Uh, it can take a really long time uh, to get some of these deals made in this industry. So... Pitfall number one that we ran into making Dungeon Siege 3, knowing your audience. When you're making a game, it is super important to understand what kind of player you're trying to appeal to. Um, on Dungeon Siege 3, we were conflicted about that from the very beginning. So at the start of pre-production, um, management came to the team with a vision for what they wanted the game to be. Um, and the vision essentially was this. Deep obsidian story with choices and consequences and branching dialogues meets fast action, twitchy, multiplayer RPG. So on the one hand, it was good that we had a vision statement because not all games have a vision statement. Um, the problem was the team immediately picked up on a disconnect in that vision statement. You guys might be picking up on it too. Uh, most action gamers don't really want to sit down and read long dialogues in between their twitchy, fighty combat. Um, they don't want the deep branching dialogues and thought-provoking choices in between their, uh, their escapades and killing orcs or whatever it is they're doing. Um, on top of that, we were adding multiplayer to the mix, and anyone who has ever tried to, to focus on story while they're playing an MMO with a bunch of friends knows that reading dialogue is not a team sport. Uh, so we, we had assumed on the team that uh, adding these obsidian narrative elements into a multiplayer action RPG would make it better, but that really wasn't what the audience was looking for. So when you're making your games, um, first lesson to impart here is uh, an important question to ask yourself is who are you making this game for and what kind of gameplay do they actually enjoy? Um, and then keep those people clearly in mind throughout production. Whenever you add a feature or you make a major change, um, ask the question, is this going to make the game more fun for that target audience that you have in mind? If the answer is yes, it's probably a good idea to do it. If the answer is no, just forget it, cut it, move on. Pitfall number two on Dungeon Siege, um, a contentious vision statement is just about the worst thing for a game. It's good to have a vision statement. It's probably better to have no vision statement than a contentious vision statement. Um, on Dungeon Siege 3, nobody really knew how to reconcile that contradiction in our vision statement, uh, and it plagued us throughout the whole project. So what that led to was a lot of internal conflict on the team. Uh, Part of the team was focused on making a deep obsidian story with choices and consequences and branching dialogues. The rest of the team was focused on making action multiplayer twitchy combat. And we were constantly arguing about which one should take priority over the other uh, because they just weren't coming together very well. Now, ultimately, the story side lost the battle. Um, I actually think that was the right thing uh, because we were making a dungeon siege game. And if anyone has ever played a dungeon siege game, story is not the main focus of those games and usually is a little bit on the weak side. Um, and I say that as someone who at the time was probably more on the story side, but it was the right choice to go with, uh, to focus on the action multiplayer combat. Um, what that meant is that we ended up making the narrative side a lot simpler and a lot more generic um, because we felt like that's what the audience would want. However, because of Obsidian's reputation for creating really great, strong stories, um, that would come back and bite us for a different reason later on. 
So ideally, what you really want um, is for everyone on the team to have a clear understanding of the game you're making so that all the content that they're making uh, supports the same goals. What you want is sort of for everybody to be able to articulate in their heads exactly the same vision. Um, and then that way, you don't even have to be micromanaging everybody. They're all sort of just of their own volition moving in the same direction. A bad way to do that is to just sort of impose your vision on the team and then just walk away and let them sort it out and talk it out amongst themselves, which is kind of what happened on Dungeon Siege. We were just sort of let, left to fight it out and, and sort of figure it out. Um, a better way to do it is to bring your vision statement or your vision document to the team at the beginning of pre-production. Um, let people talk about it, let them hash it out, encourage them to sort of, uh, uh, you know, figure it out beforehand and then bring up any problems that they might see to you early on. If you have a team full of creative people, guaranteed, they're going to bring up a whole bunch of problems that you hadn't even thought of. Um, and then that gives you the chance, if you're doing it during pre-production, to hash it out then, fix those problems, and then move on. Issue number three, or pitfall number three on Dungeon Siege, three, um, diverging from the franchise. So this is very specifically focused on sequel and franchise games. Um, if you end up working professionally in the, in the industry, guaranteed you will work on sequel and franchise games. You could argue that that is all I have done in my career is work on sequel and franchise games. Um, so we know we're game designers, we're creative people. Um, it is very common if we are asked to work on a sequel uh, we want to put our own mark on that franchise, right? We want to take the story in a new direction. Uh, maybe we want to reinvent the gameplay or add some cool new systems that we came up with. Not always such a good idea on a franchise game. So case in point, um, on Dungeon Siege 3, our systems team worked really hard to create a whole new combat system for that game. Um, it was an interesting system. Uh, it was actually pretty fun, but it was based more on games like Devil May Cry than it was on the Dungeon Siege games. Um, we made that same mistake with a bunch of things on the game. Um, for example, in the previous games, you had been able to create your own character from scratch at the start of the game. Um, we did away with that, and instead we had four pre-made characters, each with their own personalities and storylines and skills and abilities, and the player was just picking between those four. They could not create their own character from scratch. Uh, the previous game also had a core set of skills, uh, so there was like combat magic and uh, nature magic and some others, that people were used to from the previous games. We did away with those two, uh, and instead we had uh, specific lineup of skills for each of those characters. So if you picked a character, you kind of had your skill and ability track. Um, again, not a bad system. It just wasn't a Dungeon Siege system. And a lot of fans felt like it just didn't feel like a Dungeon Siege game. So keep in mind, even if you as a game designer really want to take a franchise in a new direction, fans probably don't want that. Um, they just had a really fun experience with uh, the original game, and they want more of that same experience. Um, so my advice, if you're making a sequel, try to stay as true to the original games as you possibly can. Uh, get to know the original games and their fan base in and out, uh, inside and out, as much as you can. I would actually argue, well, first of all, become a fan, <clears throat> become a fan of the games if you can. So like play them all. You would be surprised how often on teams where they're making a sequel to uh, a franchise. People haven't even necessarily played all of the previous games, which is really bad. Play them all, uh, spend time on the forums. This is the only time I will ever tell you to spend time on the forums. Uh, go on the forums and especially see like what people are repeatedly complaining about. Like if you're seeing the same complaint coming up multiple times, that's the stuff you should focus your energy on. That's the stuff you should fix. The things that, they're, that fans are used to or the things that they already like just give them more of the, the same stuff that they're used to or that they like. So, the verdict on Dungeon Siege 3. So we shipped the game in 2011 um, to mixed reviews tending toward negative. Um, we were not a commercial success. The gameplay actually wasn't bad for an action RPG. Um, but it didn't really feel like a Dungeon Siege game. We literally had reviewers say, 
I would have given this a much better review if it didn't have Dungeon Siege in the title because the game's actually not that bad. It just doesn't feel like part of the franchise. Uh, and then obviously fans of the series were not super happy with it. Uh, just about everyone agreed that the narrative and the story side were weak, uh, especially for Obsidian. We had simplified back so much that it just wasn't that interesting anymore. Uh, essentially, we overcorrected. We were trying to sort of pull back for the Dungeon Siege audience, um, and we just went too far. So, how could we potentially have fixed Dungeon Siege, or at least improved it? Um, most important thing, in my opinion, is to fix the vision. Uh, instead of trying to wedge branching dialogues and a deep obsidian storyline into the Dungeon Siege franchise, we should have focused on making incremental improvements to what was already there. We should have taken a look at what the storytelling was like on the previous games and said, how can we at least make this a little bit better, but in the same theme? Instead of being like, hey, we got this obsidian RPG thing over here. We're going to wedge it into the Dungeon Siege franchise. It just didn't work. Um, we also shouldn't have diverged so much on the gameplay side. Um, what we should have done, as I sort of suggested already, was to focus on what the franchise was already doing, fixing things that fans had complained about, um, and, uh, and, and giving them more of the stuff that they had really liked, or at least that they were used to. Uh, the final thing is management should have come to the team and consulted us early on with the vision statement. Uh, ideally, they would have come to us during pre-production and said, hey guys, here's what we're thinking of for the vision. What do you guys think of this? Um, and I, we would have brought up, we would have surfaced a lot of these problems that ultimately plagued the project. Uh, and we could have fixed them early, but instead they just kind of said, here's a vision, have fun. And like all these issues were bubbling up throughout production. By the time everyone became conscious that these were big problems, it was too late. So part two, we're going to move on to game number two, which is Torment, Tides of Numenera. Um, so what was Torment? Uh, it is a more recent game. It was a single player RPG. Uh, it was made by my former employer in Exile Entertainment, shipped in 2017. It was intended to be the spiritual successor to Planescape Torment, which was a classic game from 1999. So to give a little background on this game, Planescape Torment uh, is still regarded by a lot of people as the best written RPG of all time. Um, it was a cult classic. It was sort of the definition of a cult classic. Not super successful commercially, um, but intensely loved by RPG fans. Also a huge inspiration to a lot of writers and designers in the industry. If you mention this game to a lot of writers and designers who are currently working in games, they will probably go crazy about, oh my God, Planescape Torment, it introduced these new horizons as to what storytelling could do in games. Uh, and I would say, if you want to write for games, I would definitely play this. I would definitely play Planescape Torment. Um, over the years, I had heard a lot of people in the industry uh, say that, man, I would really love to make another game in the, in the Torment series. Problem was, um, based on the story in, it was kind of a self-contained story in Planescape Torment, and based upon the way it ended, a sequel didn't really make a lot of sense. Um, also, publishers at the time, especially like six, seven years ago, were not super interested in making a sequel to a game that was not a giant commercial hit, right? They wanted the next Halo. They didn't want sort of just like a base hit. They wanted a home run. That all changed uh, in the Kickstarter revolution of 2012-2013. Uh, all of a sudden, classic franchises that had been lying in the dustbin for 10, 20 years were getting rebooted, and they were really doing well. They were getting a lot of pledges on Kickstarter. Uh, so you had games like Shadowrun Returns made 1.8 million, uh, Wasteland 2 from In Exile 2.9 million, um, and these maximums kept going up like as Kickstarter moved along, the possibilities for getting a lot of money continued to rise. Pillars of Eternity, spiritual successor to Baldur's Gate 3, uh, made 3.9 million. Now, In Exile Entertainment, who I used to work for, um, had already had some success on Kickstarter with, with uh, Wasteland 2. It had actually saved the company uh, right before Wasteland 2's Kickstarter. In Exile, was, it had just laid off uh, a majority of its staff 
um, it was looking like in exile was going to have to shut its doors. And this was kind of this last desperate attempt to save the company by putting Wasteland 2 up on Kickstarter. Um, that worked out really well for them. So they were like, hey, let's, let's try this again uh, and maybe even do it better this time. Uh, so Brian Fargo, the head of the company, um, acquired the rights to the Torment name. Notably, he did not get Planescape uh, for business reasons that I don't understand. Um, Wizards of the Coast decided they did not want to license uh, Planescape at that point at that point in time. Um, so instead, they went to Monty Cook Games and they licensed the Numenera setting uh, and started putting together a Kickstarter campaign. Um, they also got some members of the original Planescape Torment team to come back and work on the new Torment. Our lead writer and our lead designer were both members of the original team, and they became the vision holders on uh, the new Torment game. We launched the campaign in, well, I, what I should say is they launched the, the campaign in early 2013 because I wasn't part of it yet, with not a lot of sense of how well it would do. It was a cult classic, like the original game was a cult classic, so People liked it, but it hadn't been a commercial hit. Didn't know how it would do. Turned out it was a huge success. Um, they got over a million in the first day. Uh, the The funding goal was nine hundred thousand. They made that back. They made that in I think three or four hours. Um, and then what they ultimately ended up with at the end of the campaign was over four million dollars, which at the time was a record for a Kickstarter game, uh, which actually stayed as a record for quite a while. It's since been beaten. So that huge success led directly to the first big pitfall on Torment, which was overpromising. So on Kickstarter, as you probably know, um, campaigns create stretch goals to encourage fans to pledge more money. Uh, so hey, if we hit $1 million, we're going to add three new levels to the game. Um, if we reach $1.2 million, we're going to get these writers to write on our game. Um, incidentally, that is how I joined the team. I think you can probably see me there as part of the $2.5 million goal. So they hit that <laughs> goofy ass picture too. Um, they hit that and uh, that they brought me on as a contractor. And then ultimately I came on as, as the full-time uh, lead level designer. Uh, now, what was interesting about Torment is they blew through all of the stretch goals that they had prepared within just a few days because they're like, we're not going to make more than $2 million, right? Well, within a few days, they had. Uh, so they had to start coming up with more and more stretch goals uh, very quickly. And then those new stretch goals were getting hit. The poster child of overpromising. Um, so unfortunately, the guys running the campaign uh, did not have time to evaluate whether the additional money they were getting at each stretch goal would actually cover the cost of implementing that stretch goal. So say you had a $2.8 million stretch goal and then you had a $3 million stretch goal. And let's say the $3 million stretch goal was, we're going to add a whole new city to the game. Not saying that was the stretch goal or anything. Um, but like, is that difference, is that $200,000 going to be enough to make a whole new city in the game? Obviously not, and in a lot of cases, those, the, the answer for those stretch goals was no. Now, this, is, this sounds like a crowdfunding specific issue. It's actually a more general problem that I have seen in games. Um, it can apply to publisher funded games. It can apply to self-funded uh, self projects. Um, it is super important to take the time up front uh, to realistically think through all the money and effort that will be required for your game uh, especially if you are making promises to someone about it. Um, that can be a crowdfunding situation like this. Uh, it can also be a publisher, or it could even be just your fans on Discord. Um, if, for example, you have your 50-page design document and you present it to a publisher, uh, the publisher says, I'm going to give you $6 million to make this design document. You better be sure that you can actually do everything in that design document for $6 million, or you're going to have a very unhappy publisher. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, uh, it pays to be pessimistic in the game industry. Um, it, everything always takes way more time than you think. Like I have never seen a feature in a game take less time than you think it's going to. Maybe once or twice we hit it on the nose, but like every other time it was like twice as long. So just assume that uh, and, and promise and budget accordingly. 
So the second big pitfall for Torment, sounds related to the first, but in a way it's even worse, um, was overscoping. Not just in stretch goals, but in every area of design. So there's our happy team. Um, <laughs> early in the project. Uh, coming off of the Kickstarter, understandably, um, we were pretty psyched. Uh, morale was very high on the team. Um, we felt like we had just put together the highest grossing Kickstarter of all time. We could pretty much do anything. Um, and the leads put together a rather ambitious plan. They spec'd out a very large game with a lot of zones, uh, a long and somewhat complicated story, totally new combat system, which we'll get to in a second, uh, a bunch of new dialogue features, and in fact, new features in almost every area, animation, art, you name it. Um, of course, all of this meant more work and more time. And one thing, uh, $4 million, although it seems like a lot of money on Kickstarter, it's actually not a whole lot of money for making an RPG or probably any game. So let's take a quick dive into one element of the game that we overscoped, which was the combat system, or as we called it, the crisis system. Uh, combat in the original Planescape Torment had been real time with pause. Uh, if you guys have ever played one of the Infinity Engine games, uh, you've seen a real time with pause system, also in Pillars of Eternity. Um, real time with pause was a known quantity. It was something we knew how to do at the time. Uh, a lot of us had worked in it before. Um, wasn't necessarily an easy system, but it was something we could have replicated fairly easily. On Torment, the decision was made to go with a turn-based system instead. And not only that, the leads wanted to design a whole new combat system um, that incorporated both combat and non-combat actions into each combat encounter. So what that meant, you'd be able to interact with objects on the battlefield, um, and those object interactions would have various effects depending upon who was still up. You'd be able to talk to all the enemies on the battlefield and maybe convince them to stand down or demoralize them or try to get them to switch sides. Um, and each combat encounter would be a distinct handmade set piece. So all of these different interactions would be kind of coming together in the combat encounter. Uh, and so just like the game itself, any given combat encounter would be different every time you played it. I think I've said this a few times before, not a bad idea in theory, um, but very difficult to carry off in practice. Um, and what it, meant was, uh, what it meant is that the system would have to be designed entirely from scratch. It needed to be prototyped. Um, it needed to be worked up like in a lot of detail. Uh, and we only had one programmer. <laughs> Uh, and for the prototyping phase of the game, for early production and uh, even a little ways into production, uh, there was only this one guy. He was very good, uh, but creating a whole new combat system as well as all the other foundational stuff that needed to happen was more than one person could handle. So compare that to Pillars of Eternity, um, which was in development at Obsidian at the same time. They were also the spiritual successor to an Infinity Engine game, the Baldur's Gate series. Um, what they did though, was they stuck to the real time with pause system, uh, rather than trying to reinvent the wheel. <clears throat> now, the tragic part is we were already licensing their technology for a bunch of other parts of our game. Um, in theory, we could have licensed their combat system as well, uh, and probably made life a lot easier for ourselves. We did not do that turned out to be a big mistake. So clearly, uh, the Torment team overscoped a lot. Um, overscoping is kind of the classic rookie mistake in game design. Um, our lead designer and our lead writer, who had been from the Planescape Torment team um, and were the main vision holders on our project, did not have a ton of lead experience going into this project. They were both smart, talented guys. Um, but they didn't really have enough experience to realize how far over scope their design was. So when you are in this situation and you may have over scoped your game, what can you do? Um, number one, experience is the best antidote or defense against over scoping. Uh, in an ideal situation, oh, 15 minutes. Uh, in an ideal situation, um, try to find leads who have experience in the industry and have done this before. 
uh, they will be able to look at a, uh, at a set of features and be like, yep, we can do this, we can do this. Uh, this is way out of scope with our budget, forget that. That's not necessarily in the cards for everybody, especially if you're starting out, you might not be able to get experienced people to work with you. Next best thing, is to try to find people to run your designs past who do have experience. Um, where can you find these people? Well, events like this is one place. Um, if you're local to Ohio, uh, local events like COG, experienced people go to those things. Um, failing that, you could even try messaging people on LinkedIn. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, uh, or other professional organizations. But the key is to try to get that input as early and as much as you can um, I would not recommend taking a 50 page design document and like dumping it in front of someone and say, hey, read this and let me know what you think, because they won't. Um, but what you could do is say, hey, um, let's go out for coffee or I'll buy you some drinks, maybe a half an hour. Uh, and, you know, we'll talk about this little design I have. Tell me what you think. Um, if you give them some bullet points in email or if you just kind of give them the highlights of your design uh, in a face to face situation, they'll probably be able to tell you whether you're crazy or what parts of these things are actually going to work. Um, and don't be afraid to, to approach people with this stuff like experienced people like to talk and, and we will be happy to give you our advice on things as long as you don't ask us to uh, read a 50 page document. And I have been asked to read a 50 page document. Um, the other thing you can do is uh, to try to prototype as early as you can. Um, prototype your core systems before you jump into full production. Uh, some companies also do something called a vertical slice. Uh, I find it really useful. It's essentially a sample level or area of the game that includes all aspects of your design. Um, what's good about a vertical slice is you're going through the whole process of making levels, uh, writing quests, testing your systems and seeing how it all works together. Um, ideally, then you would iterate on that vertical slice until it feels pretty fun and pretty good. And then you can go and build out the rest of your game with those lessons in mind. Um, assume that your systems are not going to be perfect in the prototype or, uh, or vertical slice phase. Iteration will always happen. But if you at least get that baseline, like 50%, 75% before you go and start building out your entire game, it'll save you a lot of time and headaches. Um, <clears throat> I would also argue if you don't have time to prototype a major new system or try it out before you start production, cut it. You shouldn't even be trying to do it. Um, or reorganize your schedule so that you do have time to prototype. Pitfall number three, uh, breaking promises. And this one relates back to the overpromising that we did during the Kickstarter campaign. So um, obviously we had a huge scope on, uh, on Torment, uh, which meant that we had to make a lot of cuts during production. We cut zones, we cut levels, we cut quests. We had to cut down the story a number of times. Uh, and because it was so complicated and complex and wasn't particularly modular, um, it kind of had a domino effect every time we had to make changes to the story. Uh, so it was like, hey, we're making these changes to the story. Uh, that means we have to change those quests. We've got to change those dialogues. We've got to cut those levels. Uh, it was a big pain in the butt. If you are writing a story, try to make it more modular, uh, especially if you're making a big game, so that you, if you do need to make cuts, like it'll be relatively minimal impact through the rest of the game. Um, we still blew past our dates. We were so overscoped that even with the cuts, we still went past the dates we had promised. Uh, and we had, to st we had to cut stretch goals, which became another big problem for us. It turns out that if people pledge money to a game and they're told they can expect certain things, they get really angry if the game ships and those features are not in the game. Um, as production went along, it became clear that we were not going to hit some of the stretch goals that we uh, had promised to people. Internally, we were like, well, will people really care if we miss some of these stretch goals if you know the game is pretty good? Yes, Torment team. <laughs> yes, they will care. Uh, the backers were extremely angry. Uh, some of them made a concerted effort after ship to tank our Metacritic score. Uh, and that effort largely worked. And it almost certainly hurt our sales. Um, so 
when you're promise, when you're making promises, do not make any promises that you're not certain you can deliver. Um, if you have to break a promise to fans or to anybody else, try to communicate and tell people early and explain why. Uh, honesty works pretty well nowadays. Uh, marketing speak does not work so well with gamers. So tell people as early as you can and be honest. Verdict on Torment Tides of Numenera. Uh, we shipped in early 2017. We never got that new combat system working the way we had wanted to. In fact, we didn't even have the resources to get a dedicated team on it until fairly late in production. So we got combat into the game. It wasn't where we wanted it to be. Some fans really liked the writing uh, and really liked the game because they enjoyed the writing. Uh, but pacing was a problem, again, because we didn't have the combat. Um, there wasn't enough gameplay to break up all the dialogue. Commercially, we were not a success. So how, in my opinion, could we potentially have rescued Torment? Um, if you talk to somebody who has played this game, they'll probably hit a lot of details that they would do differently or that they didn't like. Um, I would actually go back to three big things that if we had fixed this, it would have had cascading positive effects throughout the game. Uh, number one, dump the crisis system. Uh, it was too much of a risk. We did not have the resources to make it great. What we should have done was adapted the real time with pause uh, combat from Pillars of Eternity because that was pretty easy. It was closer to the original games than the new system would have been. Um, and as the head of the level design team, like I knew we could have totally done that. We could have taken a real time with pause system. We knew how to work with it. We could have made levels very easily with that system, hit the ground running and made a lot more and better content. Um, second and this is partly on me. Um, the more experienced people on the team really should have pushed back earlier against the giant scope. Um, my reasoning at the time was uh, I hadn't been on the original Kickstarter team. Uh, I was not one of the vision holders on the project. I saw my job as trying to figure out ways to make the vision holders vision come true as opposed to being like, you shouldn't do this. That was really stupid. Uh, I should not have done that, and I would do it differently. Um, go with your instincts. If you have concerns about something that's going on in the game, like tell people and, and uh, follow your gut instincts. Usually they're right. Uh, and then third, um, we should have told our backers much earlier that our stretch goals were at risk. Um, we sort of knew a few months out that there were going to be problems. What we did was we waited until I think like the week of ship to be like, Hey, by the way, some stretch goals aren't going to get hit. Um, that was a bad idea. If we had told them earlier, I actually think a lot of that anger that happened at the end would have kind of blown itself out earlier on. Uh, and they might've, there would have still been some pissed off people, but like, they probably wouldn't have gotten together in a concerted effort to tank our review scores. Like our user score was down to like four or five at one point. It's since come up to seven. It was all because of that effort, which, you know, the internet is a wonderful place. It's just kind of how it goes. Um, but yeah, that was, that was another big mistake we made. So that's Torment. That's the presentation. Hope I gave you guys some uh, insight into some games that went super wrong. And uh, thank you very much. Happy to answer questions. Yep. Where I've kind of made something that might be a bit beyond my current skills. Would, what, would, would you recommend uh, changing the scope of the project or just shelving it and developing those skills while working on other projects in the meantime? So shelving projects is not always a great idea. Um, I would say a lot of it comes down to your passion for the project because uh, you're the one that's got to get up every day and, and work on it. Um, so if you are still super excited about the core idea of it, then what I would say is stay focused on it, um, bring it to someone experienced and try to figure out what parts you can pull out. I mean, if you look at the design as a whole, you, there are probably some things that you are a lot more excited about than others. So try to focus your design on the stuff that you're super like charged up about again, because like half of getting a game out and like making a good game is just like getting up every day and working on it. Um, so it's, I usually discourage people from just shelving projects because a lot of times people will then 
like work on another thing for a while and then shelve that and another thing for a while. And, and then you end up with like 10 unfinished projects on your hard drive, which sucks. So if you can finish a project and like bring something to completion from the perspective of people in the industry, if you ever want to get a job like in the professional industry, that's a lot more impressive than having 10 failed projects. Um, so number one, if it's still exciting to you, try to continue with it, but get some experienced feedback. If it's not exciting to you, then yeah, do something else. Um, I know a couple of uh, companies have done this, and certainly it's been more popular with Kickstarter, but uh, companies that will try to directly involve their fans or their backers in the development cycle. And I was curious what you thought of that. Well, we sort of did that. I mean, it depends. Different companies do it in different ways. There was Starting around 2012, 2013, there was like a million different ways that people tried to do it because no one knew what the best way was. Um, we had backer NPCs. Uh, we had design a quest. Don't ever do that. Um, <laughs> uh, anything where you're like asking fans to design parts of your game, not a good idea because um, you don't know who's going to have a lot of money and be able to do it. You know, it's not necessarily going to be a good designer. Um, Backer NPCs can be kind of fun. Like if the if the backers are just providing like, I want an NPC with my name, like you should really set out uh, the criteria, right? Don't just be like, come up with anything. But like, if you say, okay, come up with a faction, you know, we have these 10 factions, pick a faction for your NPC, pick a name for your NPC, and then like two sentences about that NPC. And that's it, like that can work. Um, because then, especially if you have an early deadline, like what we did is we just worked with those NPCs. We like just found ways to fit them in and it worked out really great. Uh, the longer you let it go and the more leeway you give them, like people will send you five pages on like their D&D &D character and it'll just be, wow, we can't do any of this. And then you have to go back and forth. It's a huge pain in the ass. So limit it, but I think it can still be kind of fun because people who are super excited will, will love that. Yeah, so uh, that's that sort of was my job for a long time. Um, the classic mo modular story, if you look at a lot of Bioware games, they have learned how to do that. Um, the downside of it is it ends up feeling a little formulaic sometimes. There are ways to make it feel less formulaic, but like having an overall story um, and then there are like a number of things you have to do that could occur almost anywhere. Um, you can put those into like a whole zone where, you know, it's like this thing has to happen and then you have a designer design that zone. And if it turns out that that zone has to be cut, there's only like one really important story critical thing that happens in there. So then you could just stick it somewhere else. Like we've done that a million times. That's sort of the classic modular, uh, modular story device um, is have a number of different things that you can do in any order. Even if you can't do them in any order, you could still kind of work with it. But you can do it in any order, and it can happen almost anywhere. And that gives you a lot of flexibility to change around if you have to. I've been uh, messing around with game engines for a while, but I never really stuck to a game project in mind. Um, my head just goes like back and forth between ideas. So how do I just focus on one idea and build that off into a, a game project? I mean, it, you just have to focus on one idea. Like, it's just like, if you find the thing that you are most excited about, like if you have 20 different ideas and God knows I have a notebook full of game ideas that I'd love to do too, right? But like the key to success in this industry and in almost any industry is just like picking something and getting it done, um, which is incredibly hard because, you know, you're going to hit that doldrum phase in the middle where you're like, I hate this project. I don't want to deal with this anymore. You just have to work through it and get it done. And like, that is a sign that from our perspective, that is a sign that you will persist and you will work through a project. And it's also the best chance for you to actually get something out there. So just like you have 20 game ideas, like pick the one that you're most passionate about and then just commit to doing it. Like, even if there are points in time where it feels like it's 
shitty and you don't like it, like go out and get feedback from somebody else, like talking to other people, especially if you have a team, but just talking to other people in general, it's like one of the best ways to get like charged up about your ideas. Again, they might like push you in a slightly different direction or like, oh, I really like that part. And then you're like, oh crap, I can focus more on that. And then you keep going. Like that's the best thing to do. You just have to power through it. Thanks. Sure. The more I read about things, they say it's never too early to start promoting your game. And I think that's nonsense. Because I, I again, go and I'll see YouTube trailers for things, and they'll go ahead and cut a trailer together, and it'll say, you know, coming 2018. Well, 2019. And <laughs> yeah. Still not out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what's, I mean, is there any value of tickling and teasing an idea? So I am not a social media guy. I am not a PR guy. Um, the public relations people have a different perspective than somebody like me. Um, I'm probably a little closer to you in that sense. Like I think it's it's probably it is a good idea to to publicize things if you can, but. <laughs> The challenge is being vague enough that you're going to get people excited, but you're not going to promise anything that people are going to be like, oh my God, we're going to be able to ride dragons in this game. And then there's like no dragons when it comes out at all in the whole game. Like that, and that happens because that's just the game development process. And no one knows that except like people like us who do game development. So it is really hard. I don't really have a great answer for that other than publicize as soon as you can with stuff that you know is going to be in the game. Um, and if that means that you're not going to publicize until six months before you come out, but your game is freaking awesome, you might be fine. But I think that's kind of where I'm leaving. Because I, I, last year, because you know, I still have a full-time 40-hour week job. The game yep. thing is just something I'm kind of playing with on the side. Yep. So I got Unity last year, kind of taught myself that. I started working on this you know, uh, puzzle platformer kind of thing. But I've spent the past year just prototyping, flight testing, you know, I had the fully working. Now that I've kind of refined the design, now I'm going back and doing my actual final graphics work. So I haven't publicized anything because at this point I've just got, you know, the placeholder graphics, just, you know, a rectangle represents the ground. I'm going to publicize that. That's not, you don't want to show that dirty little secret. That's yep. what it makes the game work for prototype. It's good enough for my tester. Yep. It's, so, it's hard, especially if you don't have art. Um, I mean, that's, Let's face it, that's what people really gravitate toward, right? Exactly. It's a cool looking you game. You want to have something that not only makes you want to play it, but it sells the game. Yep. So, I mean, I have my main little character, probably about you know 70% design at the time, but now I'm backing up and refining. I just finally finished his final design and rendering the, the little logo, and you know, I got that started. Yeah, it's, it's a challenge. I mean, you can come up and we can chat about it afterward if you want. Uh, I think we're, yep, our time's up. So that is all. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And I am very happy to stay here and answer questions afterward. <laughs>